We will continue to pursue a long-term strategy to turn the tide against ISIL by supporting the new Iraqi government and working with key partners in the region and beyond. Over the last week, we saw historic progress as Iraqis named a new Prime Minister-designate, Haider al-Abadi, and Iraq's outgoing Pr Prime Minister uh, uh, Maliki agreed to step down. This peaceful transition of power will mark a major milestone in Iraq's political development, but uh, as I think we're all aware, the work is not yet done. There is a game plan to ensure Iraq gets back on solid footing and becomes a part of the global political scene without the constant threat of war. At least we're constantly told there is a plan. Whether we can see it becoming a reality is a different matter entirely. American airstrikes continue. The Mosul Dam is no longer in the hands of ISIS. But for how long? And how goes that new government we are told is prepared to bring a country back together? Welcome back to Midpoint. The former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense who served during the first Bush administration, contributing editor to the American Spectator and contributor to National Review Online, Jed Babin. Jed, thanks so much for being here today. Good to be with you again. Jed, from what you know and from what you are hearing, how are things going? Simple question with regard to airstrikes and at least pounding ISIS back just a little bit. Well, I think the airstrikes are doing a pretty good job, although they're not undercutting the real substance of ISIS. Uh, the problem I have with this whole thing is we're targeting specific actions that are going to damage ISIS a little bit, push them back a little bit, and help the Peshmerga forces, the Kurdish forces, uh, defeat them at least so far as the Mosul Dam and some of the small towns around it. As to really going to the heart of ISIS, trying to defeat that as a force, we're not even trying to do it, and that's what we should be doing. Okay, so let's get to the heart of ISIS then. In your opinion, then, where do we need to strike? Well, anywhere they have a vehicle moving. I mean, these people have tanks, uh, armored Humvees that they've captured from the Iraqi forces who ran when they approached. Uh, you know, we could put a satellite above Iraq, park a reconnaissance satellite there, put a couple of uh, J-STARS uh, battle management aircraft in the air there, an AWACS aircraft, and really pound the ISIS forces. They should not have a vehicle able to move without an American airstrike going after it. While we're sitting so much and talking about the Peshmerga being able to help us on the ground, how much can we do, should we be doing, in order to work with, and boy, I'll tell you, people are going to hate to hear this, Syria. Because right now, when you look at what's happening with ISIS in Syria, ISIS has seized most of the oil-rich east. The fighters are advancing to the north. The Syrians are trying. But, boy, I'll tell you, that's a tough thing to bear right there that we'd have to at least get involved with the Syrians. No, it really isn't, because we shouldn't. I mean, when you're talking about ISIS fighting the Syrians, there are no good guys in that fight. As many of them as they want to kill each other, it's fine by me, and it should be something we just simply stay out of. The object is, well, you have Assad, which has been his government and his father's government, was declared a terrorist sponsor since 1979. So there are no good guys on either side of that fight. And again, we should just let them hash it out and kill as many of each other as they're able to. So you don't believe in the my enemy or the friend of my or the enemy of my enemy is my friend? No, I believe my enemy is my enemy. And when we're coming to terrorist powers when we're dealing with them there. I mean, Assad is no less a terrorist power than ISIS is or at least wants to be. I mean, ISIS is something that we're going to have to contend with eventually, and that's where I'm saying we should do as much as we can now to damage them, and to the extent they can damage the Syrians, let them knock themselves out. What is stopping us then in going after the heart of ISIS? Is it simply a will from the administration? Sure. They don't have a plan. I mean, we keep talking about, well, there's a plan. The president keeps saying there's a plan, but there really isn't one. I mean, if he had a strategy for defeating ISIS, that's one thing. Right now, all his strategy is, well, let's keep them away from the Mosul Dam. That's not a strategy. You don't defeat the enemy by gradually allowing him to take or retake different targets. The basic point here is you have to go after the heart of the enemy. The heart of ISIS right now is in their ability to move and move quickly. They can maneuver forces because they operate unlike most terrorist organizations have ever operated. They can operate pretty much in the open with trucks they've captured with, from the police. We see them on the news pretty much every time we look. I mean, there's pickup trucks, there's armored Humvees, there's tanks. None of those vehicles should be able to move. That's why I'm saying you put a couple of J-STARS up there, you put a lot of aircraft in the air to destroy those vehicles, and you pretty much destroy ISIS's ability to do 
Pretty much anything. Knowing what you know of when it comes to working behind the scenes, working in the White House here, is there any doubt in your mind that there is at least somebody, maybe more than one, people who are in the president's ear every single day, at least trying to get in his ear, saying, Mr. President, this is not doing enough. This is what you've got to do. This is what we need to do. We've been here. We know how to work these wars. If you don't do this, you're going to lose. Well, I don't know that there are people like that right now. Uh, there's not someone to encourage them. You don't have... Well, Secretary of Defense Hagel is not that kind of guy. Uh, you don't have people like that in the intelligence branches. You don't have people like that pretty much anywhere. I mean, you might have someone like, well, General Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That would be his job. But I don't know if the president listens to him. I don't know if the president even meets with him. There has always been this following story, and we've been looking at it an awful lot, the mass genocide of Christians that is going on at certain parts around the world, but certainly what ISIS is doing is absolutely abhorrent, what they've been doing to Christians. Do you see this as part of the plan? And knowing full well that ISIS is not stupid, was this part of their overall idea that as we moved in, this was going to be part of what we're doing, or are they just doing it simply because they're evil and they can? Well, I think it's a combination. I think they've got an ideology that drives them to do that. Their ideology is not even confronted, far less defeated, around the world so they have this ideology that you know compels them to go out and, and crucify christians and murder yazidis and murder other minorities wherever they find them i mean this is what you get these guys are trying to make a name for themselves that are they are more radical than al-qaeda they're doing a pretty good job so if you want to defeat their brand you defeat their ability to do that again you can't just play around with these guys we, we're nibbling at the edges if we're going to do something and regardless of whether the new government of Iraq is able to create a nation there, which I don't think they're going to be, but regardless of that, the issue now is we know, I mean, heck, the Brits have said, uh, David Cameron has said that he believes that ISIS is a danger to the United Kingdom. He, we believe, and we've said it many times, I've heard a lot of people in government say that they believe that ISIS is a danger to the United States. Mike Rogers, chairman of the Intelligence Community uh, Committee, was uh, simply saying that this morning. I mean, why don't we take them on? If we believe they're a danger to us, we ought to be doing something about it. And right now, we're nibbling at the edges and really not doing the job. Two minutes I got left. Two things you said in here that I want to touch on. First of all, you used the phrase, do something. Let me work off that. In a USA Today Pew Research Center poll, it is now 44% of Americans said that the U.S. bears a responsibility to, quote, unquote, do something about the violence in Iraq. <sighs> Okay, I, I, I hate to sound so exasperated at this point, but are we getting to the point right now where seeing what's happening with the Christians, where the American public is now finally coming to the realization that we have been placed in a situation that you cannot win this war without putting troops back on the ground? Well, there's a lot of things uh, that you just said, and I think we've got to parse them out a little bit. I don't think we have to put troops on the ground. I think the American public is not focused on this issue. I think it probably ought to be because this is a big problem for us, and it's going to be when ISIS sends its troops back here on their American passports to try to create terror cells in the United States. But America is not focused on this. We're focused on Ferguson, Missouri. We're focused on Obama's possible uh, immigration action uh, by executive order. All of those things take precedence in the American mind, and unless people start really focusing on this, the media is not going to focus on it, the press is certainly not going to focus on it, and there's no motivation for us to do much of anything except what the president is doing, which again is just nibbling at the edges. About a minute or so that I have left here, I'm just gathering here from what you've been saying, but I'm beginning to gather from you that you have absolutely no confidence whatsoever in whatever new government is formed in Iraq to basically get anything done at all. Well, yeah, I mean, they may do some small things, but don't forget, Iraq has never been a nation. You have the Kurds in the north, you have the Sunni in the center, you have the Shia in the south. It was a, a, a British exercise in line drawing after the Ottoman Empire fell. And there has never been a nationalism to create the state of Iraq. And I will tell you that I think long about 2006, I was on some uh, TV show, I think the Al Hura station, that the State Department used to sponsor. And I predicted then that we would have a partitioned Iraq. And some Iraqi parliamentarian was saying, oh, no, as long as the sky is blue and the grass is green, there will be an Iraq. Never is going to happen again. I don't believe there's not any force strong enough to unite that nation. Former Deputy Under Secretary of Defense Jed Babin, it is so, so pleasurable to have you here on the show because it's good to get some really solid, truthful answers for a change. Please come back. Let's do it again soon. Thanks. All right. Later on this hour.
From the tragedy of Robin Williams' death to what may be a positive legacy he is already leaving behind. And after the break, turning the tables on a federal indictment and staying on track for the White House, Rick Perry has a plan. And you get the feeling the Democrats are helping him. It's coming up next right here on Midpoint.